Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time to come out, and I'm really delighted to be invited to your circuit uh, event to have a conversation about uh, the present and the future of the Missouri Synod. Uh, you know the story of Queen Esther. Uh, she ends up in the king's harem, the Persian king's harem. The Persian king sends his uh, current wife away, and she ends up being chosen to be the wife of the Persian king. Evil Haman plots against, and he's an age-old enemy of the Jew, Jewish people. He plots against the Jewish people, and he gets the king to sign a decree saying that all the Jews in the kingdom would be killed. And what is Esther to do? Her relative Mordecai comes to her, and he says, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And the Lord stirs in her heart to have the courage, and the tide changed dramatically, and the people were protected because of her courage. We are in challenging and uh, uncharted waters. I talked to my friend Larry Rast, president of our Fort Wayne Seminary, just in the last week or two, and he said a lot of what we're seeing in the challenges we face in the Missouri Synod most recently, being driven by the internet, is unprecedented in the history of the church. I think that's the only thing he's ever said was unprecedented in the history of the church. We face deep challenges, but there have been challenges in the past, uh, deep challenges indeed. I think of uh, Hermann Zasse, who unbelievably knew what was coming in the Hitler regime and in 1932, he was head, a pastor, scholar, young man. He was head of the religion uh, annual for the entire Protestant church and churches of Germany. And he wrote a scathing piece against the Aryan paragraph of the Nazis, which had said that the Nazi party accepts positive religion and supports the church to the extent that it does not threaten the Germanistic sense of morality. Here's how Sasa responded. According to the Protestant doctrine of original sin, the newborn infant of the noblest Germanic descent endowed in body and mind with the optimal racial characteristics, is as much subject to eternal damnation as the genetically gravely compromised half-caste from two decadent races. And we must go on to confess that the doctrine of the justification of the sinner by grace alone and by faith alone is the end of Germanic morality just as it is the end of all human morality. We are not much interested in whether the party gives its support to Christianity, but we would like to know whether the church is to be permitted to preach the gospel in the Third Reich without letter hindrance. Whether, that is, we will be able to continue undisturbed with our insults to the Germanistic or Germanic moral sense as with, as with God's help, we intend to do. It's amazing he lived through it. This, for me, is a very interesting quote. You know, today, it's common to call Christians with traditional biblical values and positions Nazis. Actually, there's something very interesting. Ed Veith wrote about this in his book, Modern Fascism. 
He said the Nazis denied a transcendent God. A God over whom, over against all people are accountable, equally, and equally valuable. And so they determined that there were some people who did not have the right to live. And the super race, the strong, would determine who that is. Today, those with that ideology fill up our universities, many in government, who no longer believe in a God, actually the God of nature that our founder, founding fathers believed in, all men are created equal. There's a creator according to our founding fathers. And which we confess as Christians. No matter what we say, in fact, exactly what we say about moral issues, social issues, from racism to homosexuality, is based completely upon the fact that God from one man created every race of people, as St. Paul says in Acts. Everything we say is based on the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And you see, for Sasa, this was an issue of the gospel. Because if you can't preach law, in order to save some Germanic sense of morality, whatever that is, you can't preach the gospel. Same issue for us today. We know what's happened in Finland this last year. Johanna Poyola, he's going to be at our convention along with Raisi Paivinen, uh, who's the courageous doc medical doctor and member of parliament in Finland, they simply wrote a tract on the Christian view of marriage and published it. And they were brought up on hate crimes by the Finnish state prosecutor. They've recently won that case and it's being appealed by the state of Finland. Mind you, one of the last holdouts for a genuine Lutheranism before the state church became awash in woke issues. Here's the issue for us. This is not about saving America. This is not about purifying America. This is for us a matter of the freedom to preach Christ crucified and to call every one of us to repentance. There's not a single person in this room who deserves the grace of God. I might know a few sins of somebody who does uh, drag shows at the library, which is abominable, but I know my own heart. And there's much more abomination than that in it. This is for us a matter of proclaiming the gospel. You know, in the second century, there was a terrible plague in Alexandria, if my historical memory serves me. And Cyprian was the bishop. And so many people were dying, they were just thrown in the streets. Nobody caring for the deceased. Nobody caring for those who were gravely ill and dying, nobody to bury the dead. And the church came forward and did all of that, even for the pagans. And the witness was absolutely overwhelming. I think we are in a similar situation, my friends. It is time for us to continue Step up, be who we are, speak Christ.
Be wise as servants, gentle as doves. I know you're doing this wherever you work. I know you're doing this. I know that you're doing it quietly where you can't do it loudly. I know you're doing this. You are a salt. I know you're doing it in your families. You are a subversive bunch, aren't you? Hold to the faith and speak Christ in those situations because you are having all the difference in the world. You're making all the difference in the world. And in fact, right in your own family, you are called for such a time as this. And this is the Missouri Synod's time too. Perhaps uh, as never before, the challenges only become more grave and difficult. We face enormous challenges in the Missouri Synod, but we have enormous blessings. We, uh, we've dealt with all kinds of things over the last 12 or 13 years, and uh, the challenges have been deep and intense. We got through the online communion kerfuffle with a unified Council of Presidents and unified seminaries. Thanks be to God. We'll have a solid resolution on that issue coming to this convention. With a prior approval process to appoint um, theological capable leaders of our universities, we have appointed five solid theological leaders of our Concordia universities. I pointed out very clearly and publicly the challenges that I thought Concordia, Wisconsin, and Ann Arbor were having with the intrusion of ideas uh, from the woke agenda. A lot of that has to do with diversity, equity, inclusion, wonderful words, but the material is shot through with secular ideas of sex, sexuality, which are absolutely contrary to the Holy Scriptures. Unacceptable. I am so thankful the Board of Regents ended up choosing a man from the prior approval list, Dr. Ankerberg. He's a wonderful man, a kind man, much like the Apostle Paul's list of characteristics we had in the sermon today. And he's a solid citizen. The future is bright. We are having the same challenges with intensity at Concordia, Texas, which opted to leave illegally, leave the Synod and our governance. We are in dialogue with them about all issues. I've been to their Board of Regents personally, talked to their leadership. But we have good leaders at our Concordia. It's the best we've had in decades, I guarantee you. And that has been difficult. We addressed the license lay deacon program where men who were not ordained, not called, examined, or ordained were carrying out the functions of the pastoral office regularly. We corrected that situation, brought them into ordination into the specific ministry pastor class and have uh, addressed that problem and brought about you, near unanimity, if not absolute unanimity, in the Council of Presidents saying that if a man is exercising the office of the ministry on a regular basis, he needs to be in the office of the ministry itself. We've engaged conversations with Lutheran church bodies all over the world, and we can continue to do that. We have so, much, so many challenges before us because so many people are in touch with us. So many want resources. So many want uh, confessionally Lutheran pastors and professors to go overseas to speak to them, to teach, to plant churches, to help them with their challenges. We don't have enough hours in the day to handle it all. We don't have enough money to do it. We don't have enough people. We don't have, we'll never have. The, de the desire for the Missouri Synod is so huge. The Malagasy Church, in Madagascar, a church of 4.5 million people. That is more, and they only count people that are in church on Sunday morning. That is more people than the entire Lutheran church in the U.S. who are actually in church. They want our help to come teach them what it means to subscribe to the Book of Concord. 
They want our professors. That's just a little piece. We are at an unprecedented moment financially in the Synod. We are in the best financial shape perhaps that we've ever been in, in our 175 year history, which is shocking. That's through fiscal conservatism by the board of directors, great mission advancement work, giving by the districts, that's your gift to the congregation, to the district, to the synod, and generous, generous donors, individuals who support the synod. And we've been able to pay off debts. Thanks be to God. $40 million debt essentially when I started that's gone. We are in an amazing, amazing, blessed position. We support about 100 full-time missionaries. That number's down because COVID. We couldn't recruit enough during COVID, of course, and then we had attrition during COVID. We're on the recruiting trail now. The number's coming up. We also have begun an alliance missionary program. So it started when Brazil, our partner church, couldn't place all of its graduates. They had a surplus, so we picked up several of them to be missionaries, sent them overseas. We've got about 30 of these people now. It's working wonderfully. We are, thank God. We've got about 1,700 congregations of the Missouri Synod directly supporting a missionary. It's enormous. We've got the strongest support for missionaries in anybody's memory. They are supported almost a year out in funding. The system works wonderfully. We've implemented a confessional Lutheran approach to world mission globally. Lutheran missions lead to Lutheran churches. And most of our mission efforts are in theological education. We've got about half lay and half clergy on the field. Our clergy are mostly teaching in seminaries overseas, training pastors for the mission. We support 15 seminaries, Lutheran seminaries, in Africa alone. They want that. Do you know why? Because they're inundated. They have these huge churches, but they're inundated by bad theology around them. Prosperity gospel. Charismatic uh, movement. All those kinds of things hit them hard. They want good, solid, biblical theology, and they know where to find it, and we give it to them as best we can. You know, people argue we don't need residential seminaries. People say, oh, well, we can, I'm doing my uh, training from, for work on the internet. It all works. No, my friends. It can be used to our advantage, and we do use it in various ways. We do have distance options for some. But my friends, there's no substitute for residential education to make a man face the confession of the church, the scriptures of the church, to learn Hebrew and Greek. There's no, no substitute for that. We have got to have, in every circuit, we have to have a couple of eggheads who can teach the other guys Greek and Hebrew right out of the Bible. You know, you guys know who those eggheads are. Maybe your whole circuit's full of them. We must have quality education. But note this. Our seminaries provide teachers, seminars, assistance building new seminaries, starting new seminaries globally. Without our resident, strong residential seminaries, the Missouri Synod's effect and influence in the world would be cut by two-thirds or three-fourths. This is a huge moment for Missouri. People want what we have all over the globe. And we're scrambling as hard as we can to provide it to the best uh, ability we can. We've got great leaders in place in our areas around the world, great solid missionaries doing wonderful work with our partner churches. We've got good relationships. There have been challenges here and there. There are always challenges, always, always, always. 
I'm so proud of our Dominican seminary. Through the work prior to that, we had not been training any pastors, not ordaining pastors in South and Central and South America for years. Leadership training doesn't get it. The church, exists, the church consists of pastors and people. Through those efforts in the last 10 years or so, we have provided 200 ordained pastors for Central and South America. We have a new hymnal for, it's Spanish-speaking hymnal. It's 700 pages. It's bigger than our hymnal. It's got more Luther hymns in it. And it's got all of these great Spanish hymns, new and old liturgies, all kinds of different liturgies, everything we've got in our hymnal, and more. And it's taking uh, the Central and South American churches by storm. They're delighted. And so are our Spanish people, Spanish-speaking people here in the United States. Um, in Germany, there's so much going on. Uh, we're assisting our German partner church in outreach to Persian Muslims, but all Muslims. We have a congregation that we've been assisting in Steglitz in Berlin. It has about 1,500 Muslim converts. These people are coming to Germany looking for freedom. The Persians had a bishop they knew in their past who was part of Nicaea, which formed the Nicene Creed. They were forced to become Muslims, and they are becoming Christians. And you know what? There are millions of Farsi speakers in Europe now, more all the time, and now we're producing resources with our friends in Berlin to travel the line back to Persia, Iran, and also to Afghanistan. It's the moment. Um, we've done all kinds of things on the national level. People always were saying, you know, well, the church is declining because of this reason. You're, you're, you're not doing contemporary worship or you're not doing the hymnal or you're doing this or that or you need a young hip pastor or who knows what. We actually did serious demographic studies on the Missouri Synod's 50-year decline. Demographics are huge. The decline of families in America is huge. The decline of the birth rate is huge. America now has the lowest birth rate in its entire history. Those are huge factors. There are some good things going on in the Missouri Synod, many of them. The fact is tens of thousands of people are joining the Missouri Synod every year. The fact is that we, has, as a percentage, have one of the highest rates of converts as adults in the Missouri Synod. There are many other positive things. Our children tend to have more children than virtually almost any other denomination. Now, further research is moving on from this, looking at, uh, looking at the issues of race and diversity regarding ethnic populations. And there's all kinds of things going on in that direction to assist us. We have many, many congregations that have various languages spoken and are reaching out with Orthodox Lutheranism to people around them. Uh, we studied the millennials. Uh, I studied two of them in my basement for 20 years approximately. I spent a million dollars doing it and I deserve an honorary doctorate. Simply put, the millennials aren't leaving the church because we studied 2,000 of them, including 400 who had left the Missouri Synod. Those that left didn't leave over worship. They didn't leave over our doctrinal positions. They left because they didn't have relationships. They left, no doubt, because of strained relationships with family. You know what the strongest thing is for the retaining of our young people? A pastor who stays put for a while. That's the most significant thing. And people who reach out and contact and talk with and hear out young people and give them something to do. Help us with the bulletins. Help us with this. Give us a hand with this leadership. All vital issues. And it's all there for you to read. Uh, we granted recognized service a status to higher things. 
We created LCMS U. Uh, we did a task force a report on LCMS schools. It is the moment for us LCMS schools. Like this school here, our schools in many places are burgeoning. People have to wait in line to get into many, many of our schools. We need more teachers. We need more rostered teachers. We need better ways to get LCMS lay people or teachers onto the LCMS teacher roster. It's a great moment for our schools. As public schools continue to decline, we'll get more and more voucher systems and those kind of programs. And those two allow us to grow and have more and more schools. Our schools are vital for us. And it's absolutely vital for us as, as much as possible to get our kids out of failing public school systems that simply undermine everything you teach them at home and everything we teach them at church. It is devastating, absolutely devastating. The Synod has an enormous mercy ministry that you have no idea about. If I told you uh, we had served since an earthquake about a year and a half ago in southern Haiti through our congregations there, there's about a dozen of them, do you know we've served 360,000 meals to needy people who don't have what they need because of the total devastation of the earthquake and the total anarchy and chaos uh, reigning in the area? People have no idea what the Missouri Synod does. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars in speaking Christ while caring for people and their immediate physical needs in the United States and around the globe. It is absolutely phenomenal. We have a mercy, a million dollar mercy match for congregations helping unwed mothers or crisis pregnancy situations or caring for uh, uh, babies, offering an option for uh, abortion. We provided a million dollars and that's already been matched by our congregations and agencies across the country. We put our money where our mouth is. We're going to throw up another million dollars on the table to match that, to care for people. You know what the argument is. Yeah, you only care about babies as long as they're in the womb. No. Put your money where your mouth is. And we are. Thanks be to God, to the great people of the Missouri Synod. Um, we continue to have life ministry conferences. Our life ministry network is stronger than ever. We speak in situations that are difficult. Illinois, tragically, was once a pro-life state. In fact, it even had a provision in its constitution that if Roe v. Wade fell, that the uh, state would go back to its pro-life uh, position previously. That was removed, and unfortunately, uh, Governor Pritzker and his um, compatriots have made this the most favorable, radically pro-abortion state in the country. And they're inviting agencies in from other states to be the magnet for abortion in this state. What will we do? We will speak Christ. We will love. We will be kind. We will say, no, there's a better way. And we all know there is a much better way. And a better way for those who have already made mistakes via a clean conscience, freed from all sins. Um, we implemented successful celebrations of the 500th Reformation anniversary, uh, published all kinds of positive and faithful articles on what it means to do Lutheran missions. We established through convention parameters for Lutheran worship, which said, follow the order of the service. When you're ditching confession absolution, when you're ditching the lessons, when you're not preaching a law gospel sermon based on the lessons, when you're messing with the Lord's words of institution, you are out of bounds. The Council of Presidents has improved and strengthened markedly in the last 13 years. It is a dramatic strengthening we work well. We work collegially. We have a wonderful new chair of the council in Lee Hagen, president of our Missouri district. Our seven mission priorities guide everything the Synod does from St. Louis. Plant, sustain, and revitalize distinctly Lutheran churches. 
support and expand theological education, perform human care in proximity to word and sacrament, collaborate with the synod's members to enhance mission effectiveness, nurture pastors, missionaries, professional church workers to, to promote spiritual, emotional, and physical well-being, enhance early childhood, elementary, secondary education. By the way, we're also working on a path for uh, approval, uh, certification of classical teachers for classical academies in the Missouri Synod. Also, we've been working through our education people for uh, school pods, as some call it, private small schools, one room schoolhouse uh, options, all kinds of different options that are different from the normal LCMS school, but used necessary for that, uh, that individual place. We are working on doing whatever we can to strengthen the family as God's primary, God's design. God has designed us male and female. God instituted marriage. God makes marriage for the procreation and the raising of children. And that is obviously God's way that it happens and should happen. We are merciful wherever broken people are, and we are all broken in one way or the other. We love and support all people, but our marriages, our families are under deep stress these days, and so it's a constant concern to do whatever we can. Our clergy are under deep stress today, facing numerous difficulties. We've supported, for teachers and, past teachers and pastors, about 45 doxology retreats all across the country to assist pastors. We know they, assist, they help and work. We provided during COVID about a thousand different uh, grants for church workers who were in need. And by the way, during COVID, we were, we were firing blind, I'll admit it. You know, when it first started out, and I knew that in the flu epidemic of uh, 1918, the Missouri Synod in St. Louis asked its churches to follow the directive of the state to the city to close and worship at home for a time. I knew there had been precedent for that. Uh, we weren't prepared for what happened. We didn't have the information that we needed. A lot of the information we were given was false. Then it grew into a huge political controversy Bellum omnia contra omnes. Uh, my approach was basically to assist local LCMS people to make their local decisions. I think the Southern Illinois District has passed a wonderful resol resolution for the Senate Convention, and I think it'll pass, no matter what the law is. And unfortunately, as we found out in spades, constitutional law since 1918 has given the government to close, the ability to close churches during epidemics. Our friends, Alliance Defending Freedom and numerous other people which we are in contact with, uh, fighting legislation, helping local circuits, local congregations, districts fight back at every turn. That's what we were busy doing. They all said, you don't, you aren't, you are not gonna win any legal cases based on the First Amendment. That's tragic. However, as your district, this district has passed a resolution saying we reserve the right to worship. And the government has absolutely no authority, absolutely no authority to say anything about what happens in this space or much less say anything about how we administer the sacraments in this space. And we must stand up and refuse any other attempts of the government to manipulate uh, us. Now we're finding out most recently that the results of the vaccines and all kinds of other issues are showing that uh, what we were told in many instances was simply not accurate. It was important for me though to support our local congregations in their own context. And the contexts across the Synod are very different. New York is very different from Wyoming or Montana. People have very different cultural views, very different views. And so 
Thankfully, the Lord has blessed us in the midst of these challenges. I told you about church relations burgeoning. We have relationships with about 100 Lutheran churches worldwide. We're in fellowship with a growing number. We'll declare fellowship, God willing, with another five or six this summer. And they continue to come to us thick and fast, more than we can possibly do. Um, I am very happy with our seminaries. We have a wonderful new president at Concordia Seminary St. Louis and Tom Egger. He's strong. I think he's theologically the strongest president we've had at that institution in probably 60 or 70 years. He's a solid citizen and he's a nice guy. Our seminaries are doing well financially. We need more students. And we think our set apart to serve effort is going to bear fruit significantly. Tell your kids to consider going to the seminary. Tell your young women to consider being deaconesses or teachers or other church workers. The schools, our universities are offering large discounts now for people who are considering church work vocations. It's time and we need you. We need you for the future. We need our young people who are willing and ready to stand up and confess Christ clearly in this world and do it for the sake of all the young people coming behind them. And there are and will be thousands upon thousands. Uh, the president has to approve a lot of people. And it's one of the hardest things that a president has to do. You have to give your prior approval to a list of people, uh, including seminary presidents, including university presidents, including heads of all kinds of synod institutions. And you invariably displease somebody every single time. Every time. My goal, by the mercy of Christ, is just to get up every single day and do the right thing. And it's about this. Does this person have the ability and theological knowledge and commitment to keep a place on the narrow road of fidelity and administrative capability to keep or make that place a solid and prosperous entity for the synod? And that's a judgment call often. We have Pete Lang, first vice president of the LCMS. Fantastic, faithful uh, man. Eric Ankerberg, new president of Concordia, Wisconsin and Ann Arbor. Bernard Bull, new president of Concordia University, Nebraska. Tom Egger, president of Concordia, St. Louis. Russell Dawn, president of Concordia University, Chicago, who has acted to remove gender studies programs and all kinds of programs that had been going on at that school which had no business at an LCMS college. Reverend uh, Dr. Michael Thomas, president of Concordia University, Irvine, who's an early church theological scholar and also uh, Irvine has a great theological faculty and they have the best system of training new faculty to keep them Lutheran and inform them on what Lutheran confessions, the Lutheran confessions are. In fact, any time a faculty member is to advance, they have to have more training on the faith. Um, we, uh, forgive me, I'm almost done. We have Brian Friedrich at Concordia St. Paul. Before he took that position, he assured me that he would straighten out several issues at the school and he has done so, and the school is prospering. Reverend Bart Day, CEO of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. Reverend Larry Rast, Concordia Seminary, uh, Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. Reverend Dean Wenthe, head of the Concordia University System. Uh, uh, Paul Philp, director of institutional research for Concordia University System. Daniel Harmelink, executive director for Concordia Historical Institute. Frank Simmet. Chief Administrative Officer of the LCMS, Kevin Robson, Chief Mission Officer of the LCS, LCMS. That position, we always joke, requires, the Chief Mission Officer requires 
who's in charge of all the ministries basically that are coming out of the Missouri Center headquarters. We always joke, we have to have Jesus with an MBA. And we're not going to find him, but we found the next best thing. Uh, we found a very faithful pastor who's got an MBA. And uh, very gifted. Jonathan Schultz, CEO of Concordia Publishing House, and many, many faithful individuals working in the headquarters deployed in national missions. It's an entirely different place than it was in 2010. We have a new, I'll just end with this. We have a new, um, actually, I won't quite end with this. Um, the Council of Presidents follows up, the District Presidents follow up on every single issue. If I am sent a, a matter or something comes to my attention, or usually a District President's attention, that is out of bounds for Missouri Synod pastor or congregation, that matter is followed up on. And many issues, most you never hear about because they've been dealt with. Uh, some, issues, some issues that go public from time to time, they've already been dealt with or they're already in process. So uh, I'm proud of what our Council of Presidents does and we take those situations seriously. There's one thing I will not tolerate. That is using the church's own called positions or other positions and being paid by the church to subvert the church's public confession. I will not tolerate that. But we have to do it with kindness, don't we? I'm proud of our Council of Presidents. Uh, public Square, we continue to speak into the public square with our um, Free to Be Faithful campaign. Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty educates people on what it means to be a two kingdoms Lutheran. It's our gift on the issue of church and state. It's our absolute gift. And it's from Jesus himself. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And we, through this office, are in touch with D.C. friends and foes alike, many friends, other Lutherans who are in the same sentiment with us, other Christians, non-Christians, and we're in touch with many congregations who are participating in becoming more informed about how Lutherans view government and the intersection between church and state. Uh, the the uh, Wittenberg Project, I don't know if you've heard of it, but right now that center in Wittenberg, we own the old Latin school in town, we're right across the street from Luther's church. We have it full of Ukrainian refugees. They've been there for months already, maybe even a year already. It's full of Ukrainian refugees children they're being catechized taught the catechism they go to church there are two ukrainian church services and a german english church service english church service every sunday in the place and we are blessed beyond belief and not only that we have a ukrainian an orthodox lutheran ukrainian pastor in wittenberg reaching out not only to the people in the building but to the 1000 immigrants in uh, wittenberg itself 1,000 1, Ukrainian refugees. So um, with that, there's always lots more, but with that, why don't we move to a Q&A? Thank you very much.